John pressed his face to the six inch thick glass and looked out the window. And you know what he saw? He saw two eyes looking back. He actually saw a fish, a little flat fish in the deepest part of the ocean, pitch black, proving that life can exist even in, under those conditions. Now, I have with me one prop tonight. I don't know if you can see that, but this used to be a full-size styrofoam cup before we attached it to the outside of the submarine and took it down to about 1,700 feet. That's a tiny fraction of the pressure that the Trieste went to. We went in 1960 and no one's been back since. And in fact, there are fewer than 10 submarines in the world that can even go to half that depth. Most of us are doing something in life because something touched our heart. The ocean is one of those magic places that seems to speak to us personally. There's a, almost a spiritual quality of it. And maybe your thing is the forest or the mountains. But I think when we're working with kids and the next generation, it's important that they can see your excitement about this. It's not just about teaching the facts, it's about showing how you feel and how excited you are and letting them share that and letting them have that experience through you. And I think as my colleague Dr. Sylvia Earle stated so beautifully and with such graceful economy of words, no blue, no green. If we don't get it right in the oceans, then all of our green efforts are for naught. Well, I thought I would start with um, one of the more bizarre jobs I ever had, which was uh, back in the early 90s. You may remember something called Biosphere 2, where uh, in Arizona, where seven individuals volunteered to be locked inside of a glass structure. They wore these sort of silly looking uniforms and were locked inside for two years in a sealed environment to survive off of what they could produce and grow. They had um, actually a million gallon ocean with a coral reef, a rainforest, a savanna, and an area to grow crops. And I was brought in as a consultant because things started to go wrong. All of a sudden, oxygen levels dropped to the equivalent of being on the top of a 15,000-foot mountain peak. It was very difficult for people to breathe. Carbon dioxide levels increased to near-toxic levels. Um, food was very scarce. That's a younger version of me on the right, but behind the glass is one of the so-called biospherians, and they are uh, you can see she's rather thin, and uh, we were not permitted to talk about food during our discussions. The point is, ultimately, life became a very hungry and brutal struggle for these people inside. They did survive the two years, but in the end, all of the pollinators died, all of the vertebrates died, and the only things that did really well were the cockroaches and ants, and they weren't even supposed to be there. The lesson here is clear. Even in an environment that we supposedly controlled all aspects of, things went awry and went awry in unexpected ways and in unexpected ways very quickly. So that's our lesson for biosphere number one, planet Earth, um, that in many ways we have to consider some of our actions an uncontrolled experiment and something that we really have to take responsibility for. They're coming from glaciers caught up in icebergs which float down to the middle of the Bering Sea, melt and drop these rocks down. Again, some, something seemingly insignificant like where a rock falls or where a fish lies, but this is the fabric of ecosystems and how they work and sometimes it's those little things that matter the most and it's the big things that we as human beings are doing to affect those little things that cause these unexpected changes in the reaction of our ecosystems. So. 
taking too many fish from the sea, or global climate change, which is affecting where those fish can live and how far south those drop stones can go. One thing that I notice is that we are losing perspective on the way the planet used to be. This is from Christopher Columbus's logbook, and I do a lot of work in Cuba, and trust me, sea turtles three to four feet long in such vast numbers that they cover the sea are not to be found there anymore. In fact, there are only 1% of the sea turtles today in the world that there were in Christopher Columbus's time. We pretty much ate the rest and destroyed their habitat. These are kids in the Virgin Islands of a fisherman that I work with down there, and they are proudly holding up dad's biggest fish of the day that he caught. Now, do those look like big fish to you? Because they, they almost look like something I'd put in an aquarium. Uh, the situation in the Virgin Islands is serious. This is what you find at the fish market. But those kids are growing up thinking that those are big fish. It's a phenomenon called shifting baselines, and it undermines our ability to make policy because we are losing our reference points because none of us were alive to remember what it used to be like. This is the most beautiful thing I've seen underwater, and this is what took us to Alaska. These deep water corals, absolutely stunning, just seemingly out of place down there, thousands of feet below. But exploration can also yield this. This is the worst thing I've ever seen underwater. I filmed this, and I was excitedly radioing the surface about 1,000 feet down, thinking I had found some sort of geologic formation. And to my horror, I realized this wasn't a natural feature at all. This was a man-made feature. I was in the path of a monstrous trawl scar that had been left by a factory trawler down about 800 feet and as you, or about 1,000 feet. And as you can see, there is nothing left. Those trawls are about as wide as the wingspan of a 737 and miles and miles long. And up comes everything, including those corals, some of which are hundreds or thousands of years old. Some corals can live to be 4,000 years old. For my 50th birthday, which came in October, I'm traveling to all 50 states and talking to kids in schools about the oceans and about the, the wonder of the oceans and also about science and about careers. And when I tell kids that 95% of the oceans await their little eyes, they get excited. And exploration can really excite them. And I show them these images from Phil Newton's magic workshop up in Vancouver, the Orca sub, built for speed. And, um, well, Phil's not building an Iron Man suit. Well, actually, he's got Iron Man beat. Next generation of pressure suits, the exosuit. A wearable submarine. Imagine getting up in the morning, putting on your submarine, and diving down to 2,000 feet and getting to work. And then imagine putting it all together in an underwater city.